Sutra. What are the two? Ananda. The first is the root of beginningless birth and death, which is the mind that senses of upon conditions, and that you and all living beings now make use of, taking it to be the self nature. Commentary. What are the two? The Buddha will now explain the two fundamental rules to Ananda, and I think everyone would like to know what they are. However, I'm not going to discuss them just that, just yet. I'm going to tell you first about Ananda's elder brother, Sudarananda, since I haven't introduced him to you yet. Sudarananda got along very well with his wife Sundari. They stuck together like glue. All day long, they stayed right beside one another. They were so compatible. In fact, to distinguish him from Ananda, Sudarananda was given the name Sundaris Nanda, Sundarananda. The day came when the Buddha went to cross Sudarananda over. He took up his bow and went to Sudarananda's home to beg for food. When Sudarananda saw the Buddha coming, he withdrew from his wife and said, Wait a bit, I'm going to make offerings to the Buddha. His wife said, You are going to make offerings to the Buddha? Well, come back immediately. Don't go, then not come back. Of course, I'll come right back, Sudarananda said. Sudari then spit on the dirt floor and said, You better be back before that dries, or I won't let you in my bed. So the Rananda he did the command and said, I'd be back right away for sure. And he took vegetables and rice to fill the Buddha's bowl. He went to fill the bowl, but how was he to know that the Buddha would act so strangely? The Buddha used his spiritual power. Every time Sudarananda took a step forward to place the to place the food in the Buddha's bowl, the Buddha backed up so that Sudarananda couldn't reach the bowl. Sudarananda kept advancing to keep up with the Buddha, and in just a few steps, they arrived at the Jetta Grove, despite of the fact that it was a long way from Sudarananda's house. Once they got there, Shakyamuni Buddha said, Don't go back. You stay here with me and live the home life. Sudarananda was shocked. He got goose flesh. Impossible, he said emphatically. I can't stay. Sudari is waiting for me. I can't remain here and leave home. The Buddha said, you can't leave home. Let me show you some things and see what you think. He took Sudarananda to a place where there were hordes of monkeys. Which is more beautiful? The Buddha asked him. These monkeys or your wife Sundari? Obviously, Sundari is more beautiful, replied Sudarananda. How could Sundari be compared to a monkey? Quite right. The Buddha agreed and took him to the heavens. As they strode among, they noticed one particular palace were bustling with activity, were as servants, scrubbed and polished. There were also 500 heavenly maidens in that place, each one exquisite beyond compare. Why are you doing all this cleaning, Sundarananda? asked one of the servants. We're getting this palace ready for the Buddha's cousin, Sundarananda. They replied, after he cultivates it, come to heaven to enjoy his blessings. These 500 heavenly maidens will be his wives. Sundarananda was ecstatic. Tell me, Nananda, the Buddha said to him, which would you say is more beautiful, Sundari or these heavenly maidens? These maidens, obviously, Sundarananda replied, why compared to these maidens, Sundari is as ugly as a monkey. Fine, said the Buddha. This place is being ready for you. After they finished touring the place, the Buddha took his cousin down to the house. There they saw two ghosts heating a cauldron of oil. One of the ghosts was sound asleep and although the other one was awake, they didn't have his eyes open. He didn't have his eyes open. Nanda sized up the situation and thought to himself, These ghosts are supposed to be tending to fire under that cauldron, but they're not doing the job at all. Boy, our ghosts are lazy. 
、uh, got lazy. Then he meddled a bit and nudged one, saying, "What are you doing this for?" A little one's droopy eyes popped open and glared at him. "What's it to you?" he snapped. "I just wondered," said Sudarananda. "You got to know her, okay? I tell you, the Buddha's got a cousin who's cultivating the blessings of people and gods. He's going to get born in the heavens and enjoy five hundred years of heavenly blessings before he falls. Once he topples." However, he come all the way down to the hell, and when he gets here, we are supposed to have this pot hot. He's to be deep fried alive. So the Rananda was horrified, and his hair stood on end. He suddenly understood the whole picture and thought, "Those heavenly maidens are ravishing, but five hundred years of bliss with them isn't worth if." Isn't worth it if I'm eventually going to end up in a pot of boiling oil. I'd better follow the Buddha, leave home, and be a monk. So he forgot about Sudari, and left home. In order to to rescue Sudarananda, the Buddha had to accompany him to the heavens and the hells. But saving Ananda, Sudarananda's younger brother was proving even more difficult. The Buddha explains one one principle. And Ananda doesn't understand. The Buddha explains another principle, and Ananda still doesn't understand. The Buddha keeps on explaining, and Ananda continues to be confused. Now the Buddha reveals the two fundamental rules that cause people to be mistaken and confused in their cultivation. He wants to lead Ananda to understand how to direct his cultivation so that he could become a Buddha in the future. Ananda, the first is the root of beginningless birth and death. From beginningless time onward, you have endured birth and death, death after birth, death after death, death after death, birth after birth. I have already explained the meaning to you. Unaware of the pure nature and bright substance of the permanently dwelling true mind, the use false thinking. Such thoughts are not true. And so the wheel keeps turning. In this passage, once again, the fundamental root of continual birth and death is revealed. It is the mind that seizes upon conditions, and that you and all living beings, not just you, but all living beings, now make use of. To seize upon conditions is to act exclusively on the basis of the false of false thought. For example, say you go to school and knock yourself out, trying to get on the good side of your professor by buttering him up. You flatter him by using all his titles and saying things you hope will please him. Why, in the hope that he'd give you a hundred, you think it's clear he's going to give me an eighty. But if I'm nice to him and maybe give him a gift or a little something. He might raise, might grade a couple of points. You gain advantages in imperceptible ways. That is an example of setting upon conditions. Another example occurs during elections for president, mayor, and senator. The candidates go around drumming up votes and soliciting support from their friends. That too is a case to the mind of setting upon conditions instead of letting things naturally take their course. If it were to happen naturally that you were to become president, you wouldn't have to campaign to let everyone see that you were a worthy candidate. Your virtue would be obvious, and people would look up to you. You wouldn't have to persuade people; they quite naturally would elect you president. That's the the ideal way to do it. Anything else falls in the realm of setting upon conditions. An ancient an incident involving in the Chinese Emperor Yao illustrates the point. When Emperor Yao got old, he wanted to relinquish his kingdom to a virtuous and worthy person. He had heard that Chao Fu and Su Yu had great virtue, and he decided to offer the empire to Chao Fu. Why was he called Chao Fu? 
nest. For one thing, he lived in a pretty strange place. He built a nest in a tree, just like a bird, and lived there. His manner of life was so simple that he drank by just scooping up water in his cupped hands. Once, some people saw him do that, and realized. He didn't have anything to drink from, so they gave him a gourd. He hung the gourd from a branch of his tree, but it made such a racket when the wind blew that he finally threw it away, deciding it was just too much trouble. Emperor Yao had heard how pure and lofty Chao Fu was, and he was determined to yield the throne to him. So he went to announce his intent. I'm old now," he said to Chao Fu. "You should come and be emperor. I'll give you give my position to you." No sooner had he gotten the words out of his mouth, than Chao Fu plucked up his ears and marched off. "I'm not the least bit interested in such talk," he retorted. "In fact, you've dirtied my ears by saying such things to me." He headed for the river, where he proceeded to wash his ears. Now it so happened that Su Yu was at the river too, watering his ox. Why are you washing your ears? He demanded. That Emperor Yao is really odious," replied Chao Fu, as he scrubbed away. He came here to tell me he wants to bestow the country on me, and he asked me to become the emperor. His proposal has made my ears dirty, so I'm washing them. How can my ox drink the water you're using to clean your ear? Exclaimed Su Yu. My ox can't drink such a filthy stuff, and he led the ox upstream for a drink of clean water. You see, in ancient times, a sage would not only refuse the imperial throne; he would even say the very request had sullied his ears. And yet today, is hey, vote for me as president. Select me as your governor. As candidates, brainstorm across country, making connections, winning and dining, willing and dealing, and even by votes. But Chao Fu and Su Yu would not set up on conditions. They represent the ultimate in pure and lofty virtue, making use of the might that sets it up on conditions. Do you take it to be the self nature? Do you mistake your ordinary might for your self nature? And that is why you cannot end birth and death. You haven't recognized it for what it is. Instead, you take a thief for your son, who in the future will blunder all the gems in your household. It is nothing but a false thought to think you can have any accomplishment accomplishment by using the might that sets it upon conditions. This is a mistake Ananda made. Sutra the second is the is the primal pure substance of the beginningless body nirvana. It is the primal bright essence of consciousness that can bring forth all conditions. Because of conditions, you consider it to be lost. Commentary the second is the primal pure substance of the beginningless body nirvana. There is no beginning. Therefore, the Buddha calls it beginningless. It was even before the beginning; the beginning itself had occurred. Bodhi is Sanskrit. It is interpreted to mean awakening to the way. There are three kinds of bodhi: the bodhi of the true nature, which refers to your inherent Buddha nature. Originally, everyone has Buddha nature. The bodhi of actual wisdom, which refers to your genuine wisdom. Not false wisdom, a spreading body which refers to the state of people who have accomplished body and who then use a spreading and clever means to teach and transform living beings. These three kinds of body can be said to be one. Divided, they are three. In combination, they are one. Together, they are the body of the true nature, and from it comes the body of actual wisdom and spreading body. Where does body itself come from? Body doesn't come from anywhere or go anywhere. Each of us is endowed with it. No one person has any more or less of it than anything anyone else. It neither increases nor decreases. It's neither produced nor extinguished. It's neither divine nor pure. 
Most people think that Vivana follows up on death, but actually it is not necessarily an after-death state. It is the certification to an attainment of a principle. Nivana is a Sanskrit word which is interpreted to mean neither produced nor destroyed. Since it is neither produced nor destroyed, birth and death are ended. One attains Nivana when one reaches the position of not being subject to birth and death. But Nirvana is not the Buddha's dying. When the Buddha dies, he enters Nirvana. He enters and certifies to the principle of Nirvana with his four virtues of permanence, bliss, true self, and purity. Some people who haven't seen things clearly in their study of Buddhism think that Nirvana is just death, but Nirvana is emphatically not death. One who holds this view does not understand Buddhist principle. It is the Brahma bright essence of consciousness. Brahma means that it is originally a pure substance, that is, one which is neither defined nor pure, neither increasing nor decreasing. Originally, its light illuminates everywhere. Consciousness here does not refer to the eight consciousnesses, nor to the eye consciousnesses, the ear consciousness, the nose consciousness, the tongue consciousness, the body consciousness, the mind consciousness, not the manas or the alaya consciousnesses. It is not any of the eight consciousnesses. It refers to the essence of consciousness, which is but another name for body nirvana. The phrase is used here to avoid repetition reputation for the sake of literary, literary style. It refers to the most essential and wonderful aspect of consciousness, the inherent Buddha nature, the bright substance of the permanent, permanently dwelling true mind that can bring forth all conditions. Because of conditions, you consider it to be lost. Because these causal conditions arise, you keep getting further and further away from where you want to be, like someone running farther and farther down the road. Didn't I say before that the more Ananda answered the Buddha's questions, the farther off the track he got, all conditions are transformed and appear from within the Prama bright essential consciousness. But after a long time of clutching at these conditions, it seems that something has been lost. What is lost? Nothing, really. The Prama Prama bright essential consciousness seems to be lost, but it isn't. The Prama pure substance of Bodhi Nirvana is the true jewel in your household. Basically, it is right there with you, but you don't know how to use it to your advantage. Since you can't use it, it seems to be lost. It is as if you had a valuable gem, which you have hidden away so well that after a long time, you can no longer remember where you put it. Once you forget where it is, you can no longer make use of it. Although you may be destitute, you don't know how to get at it and derive benefit from it. It's the same as if it weren't there. What do you use instead? You use your false thinking, your mind that senses upon conditions. In the process, you forget the true mind, and once it is forgotten, it is as good as lost. And this is why you have not become Buddhas and are bowed up by birth and death instead. You have not found your true mind. Sutra, living beings lose sight of the original brightness. Therefore, though they use it into the, to the end of their days, they are unaware of it. And without intending to, they enter the various destinies. Commentary, living beings lose sight of the original brightness. Living beings seem to lose their pure basic nature, the bright substance of the permanently dwelling true mind. In actual fact, it is not lost. Therefore, though they use it to the end of their days, they are unaware of it. Living beings use the pure nature and bright substance of the permanently dwelling true mind every day. Since it is primarily from the true mind that the false thinking mind which assesses upon conditions springs forth in the first place. 
absolutely everything is a manifestation of the true mind and it helps you from morning to night but you don't realize it all you know how to use is your false thinking mind the true mind is manifest in seeing hearing smelling tasting awareness and knowing what is the buddha nature someone once asked shakyamuni buddha replied in the eyes it is called seeing in the ears it is called hearing in the nose it, is, it smells sense in the tongue it tastes in the hands it is dexterity in the feet it is agility he said what is the buddha nature it is the seeing nature and the hearing nature it is the natural way in which the hands hold things all of these are imperceptible manifestations of the true mind but people are unaware of it now ananda is still confused and so the buddha uses all manner of analogies to explain to him and without intending to they enter the various destinies because they cling to the mind that senses upon conditions living beings enter their various destinies and yet are unaware of what they are doing your destiny is the place you tend toward you walk right into it where do you end up in the various destinies that is on the turning wheel of the six paths there are the three god you know, three good destinies of the god the asuras and pupil and the three evil destinies of the animals the hungry ghosts and the hell beings whatever karma you create you undergo a retribution for it without realizing it you end up by entering one of the six paths it is not that you particularly want to but for you do just the same the destiny of the asuras is sometimes listed as an evil destiny asuras are said to be strong in fighting since fighting is what they like to do best they are always ready to pick a quarrel with people asura is a sanskrit word which is interpreted to mean without wine and also as deformed asuras like to drink wine but when they are in the heavens they don't get any wine to drink deformed refers to the male asuras whose bodies and faces are misshapen and ugly they have a hair lips and buck teeth but the asuras women are gorgeous the jet emperor and cutter to one such a particularly beautiful female asura and chose her for his wife now the jet emperor chakra that is liked to go here to trust he will transform himself into a man and come to this world to listen to sutras but his asura wife drank vinegar that is he got she got jealous you go off to the world every single day i wonder what weird essence of false spirit has got you in her clutches you're chasing after a false spirit aren't you he was accusing him of playing around with another woman only women are not the only ones to get jealous about their husbands even julia shakra's wife decided to make herself invisible and follow along to find out what he was up to in this day and age there are private detectives to handle such matters but probably they didn't exist then so she had to run her own investigation and spy on him for herself so when the jet emperor arrived at the drama assembly he bowed to the drama master paid his respects and then took a seat in the assembly it just so happened that on that particular day there were women sitting on either side of him when the asura woman saw that she was beside herself and she made herself visible right there in the assembly to confront the emperor it's no wonder you come here every day so with so many women to keep you a com- company she began the jet emperor was outraged I come here to listen to sutras and you backed in and disturbed the body manda you really creating heavy offenses he bowed her, her ears and she burst into tears ran off to find her father she demanded a divorce and refused to go back to her husband 
Her father came to her defense and promised to wage war on the Jade Emperor. I defeat him and take the throne. He consoled her. Don't fret. The fight was on. Every day the Asura king did battle with the Jade Emperor. The Emperor called out his full uh, real Gallia, but the Asura king's ferocious battalions were in their element, and little by little the Jade Emperor was beaten back. He was losing ground fast uh, as, faithful, as a faithful follower of the Buddha. He went to the Buddha and asked him to devise some strategy. The Buddha gave him his kashaya, his rope, saying, Take this bag with you, tear it into strips, and have each of your soldiers carry a piece of it. Then tell them all to recite Mahapranara Paramita, great wisdom which has reached the other shore. The Jade Emperor did as he was instructed. The entire army began reciting Mahaprana Paramita, and when the next attack came, the Asuras fell. They were totally unprepared for the unprecedented force of the heavily chosen blows and admitted defeat once and for all. Asuras are said to be deformed. They have the blessings of the gods, but not the virtual. There are Asuras not only in the heavens, but also among people. Soldiers and thieves are examples of human asuras. But a distinction has to be made here. In this country, military service is mandatory and people are drafted. Some of them are not asuras. Some of these that go into battle are just kids. At 18, they are drafted and at that age, they haven't the least bit of somebody power. They get jittery at the mere mention of war. Front-line troops should be trained for five years. For instance, they'd be 23 if they enter the service at 18 and train for five years. And by that time, they have a little somebody power and some experience so that they are sent to, into battle. They have sufficient courage to cope with it. If they're too young, the somebody isn't strong, they lack experience, and they haven't got any guts. So I think that... In the present circumstances, not every soldier is an Asura. In former times, people who actually wanted to be soldiers and robbers could be classed as Asuras. There are other Asuras besides soldiers. For instance, someone who has a big temper and is always picking fights with others has the nature of an Asura. In general, Asuras have violent tempers. White stallions are an example of asuras. There are also asuras among the hungry ghosts, for the most part, living beings enter the four evil destinies. This is the meaning of, the, of this, this passage of text. Some living beings don't lose their way and are born in the path of people or in the heavens, but that is still to enter the various destinies without intending to, to take the wrong road.